Hi, I'm Stephen Jones. At Robert Wood Johnson, we believe citizens need to be informed about the important health care issues affecting their lives. That's why we're proud to support the health care programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by PNC Bank, Bergen Community College, United Water. Making the planet sustainable is the best job on earth. Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, the heart of academic medicine. The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey. And by Choose New Jersey. Our mission is attracting companies to the Garden State. Promotional support provided by NJ.com. Small news, big news, true Jersey. And by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. We're at the Tisch WNET studio here in the heart of Lincoln Center. It is our pleasure to welcome, for the first time here in our studio, a gentleman that uh, people have recognized for at least a couple of decades here, uh, Bernie Carrick, who is uh, the author of a book called uh, From Jailer to Jail, the former New York City Police Commissioner. Good to see you. Thank you, sir. Um, you've had a heck of a career, a life. I've had a, a crazy life. I, uh, uh, 35 years in law enforcement. I, you know, I started as an MP. Uh, I've been a cop, a correction officer, a federal drug agent, a warden. Uh, I ran Rikers for six years and uh, ultimately became the police commissioner. Mm. And uh, unfortunately, was there during 9-11. So it's, uh, it's been ups and downs, but it's, uh, it's been a good career. 9-11 um, changed your life? Yes. How? Um, it, uh, most importantly, I think it, I realized that you just cannot take life for granted. Um, you can be here today and gone tomorrow. And, uh, and I think I came to realize that um, when, you know, 3,000 people perished in a matter of minutes. Um, and I, I got, to, it, it was very personal to me. You know, I lost 23 people that worked for me. Um, I lost a number of friends um, that died in the towers, and I got to see the aftermath and the effect on uh, on this city, this country, um, um, the resilience of the city. Uh, but most importantly, I, I came to realize very quickly, uh, you just don't know, and you should take every day. Uh, you know, uh, don't don't ever take it for granted. Mm. You know, we were talking about before they got on the air. Your, your guy was born and raised, uh, you grew up in Patterson? I was born in Newark, raised in Patterson. Yeah. Um, major reputation here in New York City, became a national figure. Um, and the, the issues you ran into, we'll talk about in a second. But the reason I mention that is, is that, you know, I grew up in a neighborhood that you know very well in Newark, and we know some of the same people. And right. Loyalty matters a lot. Right? It does. So people come to connect you very closely to uh, Rudy Giuliani. Mm -hmm. During that 9-11 period, he became, quote unquote, America's mayor. You're right there. Right. Soon thereafter, um, you become recognized as someone who can deal with very difficult situations. And uh, your name gets put out there as someone, hey, wait a minute. Homeland Security is a huge issue. Why not Bernie Carrick? And you're thrust from handling Rikers, handling uh, New York City's uh, police department, everything you've dealt with to this particular position. And I don't know whether you had any idea what you're gonna go into or not, but let me just get to the point. You're thrust into a media situation and, and your background is looked at in a way that I'm sure you may or may not have expected, but ultimately, um, issues are played out regarding um, 
there's a nanny in your family that tax, payroll taxes were not paid, and so there, there you are on the front page of all the papers. Long story short, some other issues come out and you wind up dealing with legal and criminal problems and you wind up on the other end in jail. Mm -hmm. What reason I lay that all out is as I was reading the book, I'm asking myself, where's your friend Rudy Giuliani in all this? You know, it's, uh, Rudy and I were close, not only as a result of 9-11. Um, I had known him since 1992. I worked with him throughout his campaign until he was elected. Um, I worked for him at Rikers. I ran Rikers. I had unparalleled successes, uh, turning Rikers into an international model for efficiency and accountability. Um, took over the NYPD, worked for him there. Then we had a private um, company, a security company, yeah. consulting company. Um, when I was nominated for Homeland Security, and then I declined and withdrew my name, um, we created distance between us. By design? Um, but, yeah, pretty much by design. I didn't want to be associated with him um, as much as he didn't want to be associated with me because it attracted media attention. I mean, if you look back to those times, every article about me, he was in it. Every article about him, when he announced he was running for president, I was in it. So at that point, we basically created separation. Um, my, the unfortunate thing, I think, was that um, after I pled guilty and I was... Oh, folks, you pled guilty. I'm sorry for interrupting, Bernie. You pled guilty to specifically? I pled guilty to full statements and tax charges, uh, primarily relating to my children's nanny. Um, and some apartment renovations I had done. And, um, Can, was, and, and serving, the, the prison term was? Um, 48 months, and I served uh, the full time uh, within the guidelines, three years and 11 days. Okay. And um, throughout that period, uh, no, nobody knows better um, than a former U.S. attorney, the- Which he was. Which he had- In the been. Southern District of New York. Right. Um, it, it, nobody knows better what that does to the family. Um, I had no income coming in at the time other than my pension. Um, and I would have hoped that he was there for my, my wife and kids. And, uh, and he just was not. And, and what bothered me, I think, more than anything is he was the godfather to my two daughters. Exactly. My 12 and my 15-year-old. Did they not reach out for him and he would not respond? Well, what happened is, is initially, uh, you know, we tried to reach out to him. We tried to contact him. In 2006, um, there was no, you know, no contact. And um, my, my daughter sent him a Christmas gift. Yeah. And it was sent back uh, to my house. And, uh, you know, it's just unfortunate. Uh, you know, everything I'm saying, though, it does not take away from my respect and my admiration yeah. for what he did for What do you city. take away from that? Um, Politics does funny things to Does people. politics trump friendship? I think it does. I, you know, politics is, is a, uh, one, it's a dirty business, extremely dirty business. And two, it, um, you know, when there's times of scandal or times of uh, hard times, a lot of politicians run. Not every politician. You know, uh, Peter King, who was the Congressman chair, Peter King. Congressman Peter King was the chairman of the Homeland Security Committee for the United States Congress. Um, but that man came to a federal prison mm. every three or four months for three years to see me. Sat in a visit room with other inmates and families and everything else. Never asked for any special privilege. Mm. Um, you know, he is what I consider one of the most loyal um, people I know. Describe your time in prison. Uh, if I had to sum it up in a sentence, prison is like dying with your eyes open. Um, you basically wind up in a stagnant position where your entire life goes on without you in it, and there isn't anything you can do about it. Your kids grow. There are deaths in your family. There's births in your family. There's graduations. There's school events. Um, your whole life goes on without you in it, and there's nothing you can do. You can't help. 
you can't, there's nothing you can do. You just sit back and watch. It's, it's like somebody put you in a coffin with your eyes open and you get to watch everything around you, your entire world go on without you in it. Someone says, okay, I have people talk about, have a positive attitude. You did, first of all, you got in better shape. <laughs> you did. I lost, uh, I lost about 80 pounds uh, while I was away. By working out and uh, not eating what? Uh, no, it's, well, first It just of doesn't all, happen. No, no, it doesn't happen. First of all, you know, my diet was uh, tuna fish <laughs> and, uh, and, and chicken for the last two years I was in. And, uh, you know, I went from somebody that would do 25 push-ups and be out of breath. I, I think the top I've done is I, I've done 1,200 in just over two hours. Um, you know, but the, that's what you do when you don't have nothing else to do, so. But uh, yeah, I got in a lot better shape. Okay. You come out, what were your prospects? Who was there for you? Um, you know, there, there have been friends that was there before I went in, um, and, and they're still there today. Uh, you know, Peter King, Geraldo Rivera. Um, uh, you know, Dick Grasso, these are people that, these are, these are people that others would know. Dick Grasso was the former chairman of the New York Stock Exchange. A lot of my friends are still there, but, you know, a lot of people run. They stick their head in the sand, you know, they, they're afraid, you know, it's like you, you have this, this Do, do you understand it, Bernie? Do you understand people saying Bernie Carrick was the police commissioner? He headed up Rikers. He was head, he was nominated to head up Homeland Security. He got involved in a scandal. He pled guilty. He did the wrong thing. He did the time. Get away from him because it could be a problem. Do you understand from a PR and media point of view? Uh, I sort of understand. I, in what fact, do you think you would have done? It, prior to my, prior to my circumstances, I may have done the same thing, um, but not, to, not to mm. my closest friends. Real friends. Yeah, real friends. Uh, and today, I look at it completely different. Um, and the reason I do that is because I know the case against me. Mm. And I know that I if I took a stack of subpoenas and give me the scrutiny power that a United States attorney has, I can indict you and everybody in this building and there isn't nothing you can do about it. Nothing. What does that mean? But you, you, you admit that you did something wrong. That's right. I don't, I don't, I, what I did, I did. But there is nothing I did that couldn't have been handled civilly. Not Tax, criminally. Not criminally. There's a big difference. You know, people have no conception why other people are in prison today. You know, and I, I put a lot of people in prison. Yeah, lots, you did. For bad people that did bad things. And then I get to prison. And I see young men, 18, 19 years old, serving 10, 15 years for possession of five grams. So what do you want to change? The entire criminal justice system what has does to mean? change. Be specific. The mandatory minimums and sentencing guidelines have got to be repealed or revamped or eliminated. Um, at some point in time, a person pays its debt to society. You do your time, you do your probation. The reality is your debt to society is never paid. You're a convicted felon till the day you die. If you get convicted at 19 and you live to be 120, the collateral consequence of that conviction stays with you forever, forever. And it has an impact on your voting rights, on your Second Amendment rights, on your, some people can't rent an apartment, some people can't get a job. Most people, most people can't get back into society. And what, what I've realized is we are creating an entire second class society as a result of the convictions. And don't get me wrong, bad people that do bad things, they belong in prison. But at some point in time, when you take a first time, nonviolent, low level offense, and you turn that guy into a convicted felon, mm. a commercial fisherman mm. catches too many fish, mm. we make him a convicted felon. Well, why do we do that, Bernie? Why have we created these mandatory minimums? Why do we say, the mandatory you know, lock minimums. them up, throw away the key. Why do we do that? We feel better about ourselves when we do that. You know, uh, and that's, uh, I think that's a part of the problem. Society has evolved into, uh, into a people that believes everything has to result in prison. Um, but that's only until it's happened to them or somebody associated with them. If you experienced what I have through some personal discourse, I promise you, you think different. 
Last question. How has this all changed you? Um, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I have a different outlook on my children. Um, they're, they were important to me before. They're 10 times more important today. Um, and I'm on a mission to bring um, a real education to the American public on what the criminal justice system is, where its flaws and failures are, and how it should be fixed. You hate politics? Just politics is a dirty business. Dirty business. One more quickie. Um, biggest lesson you learned about being a leader? Go with your gut. Don't, don't, uh, don't lead, don't manage by polls. Um, you know, there's a right and a wrong and a good and bad. Do what's right, do what's good. Do it for the people. And uh, if you look at my experience, my background, and what I've done my entire career, up until the day I withdrew from consideration, um, I've had enormous success living by those standards. Thanks, Bernie. Thank you, sir. The name of the book is uh, From Jailer to Jailed, My Journey from a Correction and Police Commissioner to Inmate Number 84 888-054, excuse me, Bernard B. Carrick. Thank you, Bernie. Stay Thanks. with us. We're right back right after this. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Hi, Steve Adubato. More importantly, I'd like to introduce uh, Admiral Joseph McGuire, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Special Operations Warrior Foundation. Uh, Joe, we've uh, had the opportunity to be here many times. In fact, here is the 24th annual Cohn Resnick Foundation Charity Golf Invitational. This is Cohn Resnick Cares. Uh, that's the foundation. The Cohn Resnick, great organization. Raise money every year in this golf outing for your foundation and also the uh, Joe Torrey, the uh, Safe at Home Foundation. Tell folks about your foundation, what it is, and, and who benefits from it. Well, uh, thank you, Steve, and I really do appreciate Cohen Resnick and all the folks who come out here and, and support the Special Operations Warrior Foundation. We started in um, April of 1980 after the failure of the Iranian hostage rescue mission. Uh, there were eight special operators who were left on the, uh, the desert uh, sand in uh, April of 1980. And the surviving men who came back from that wanted to do something to honor their sacrifice. So they started the scholarship fund. And that's when the Special Operations Warrior Foundation began. There were 17 children who uh, were the surviving children of those eight men who perished. And uh, the foundation passed the hat. And we had pretty modest means back then. Uh, but those children went to college. All 17 graduated. And since then, people have a tendency to forget that we had uh, Grenada, Panama, First Gulf War, Somalia, Yugoslavia, and for the last nearly 14 years, this war, and we've lost 940 special operators over the years, and they've left 1,067 children behind. And our solemn pledge to them is, if you lose your life in the service of your country, then the Special Operations Warrior Foundation will ensure full college benefits for your children. Now, when you die, the government does provide some benefits for the family through the VA and through, uh, through other means. But uh, what we do is we ensure full college tuition, payment, books, fees, computers for any university in the country. In addition to that, we provide tutoring for all of the children from kindergarten through senior year in, uh, in college. We have a historic 90% college graduation rate, but we'd like to have 100. So mm -hmm. we do provide college uh, uh, tuition even for the seniors. But we first and foremost do scholars, uh, scholarships for the children. The other thing that we do and we're very proud of is we provide immediate financial assistance for special operators who are wounded in combat, severely wounded. And uh, we've started this program in 2006, and since then we've given $2.2 million of immediate financial assistance to the wounded. Although the special operation forces comprise less than 2% of the operational forces on the battlefield, they've suffered well over 10% of the casualties. 10% 10%, over 10%. So what we try to do is, you know, just, just help them and the family get together when they're in the hospital and help them through the immediate financial crisis when somebody's severely wounded. 
You know, as you listen to the Admiral talk, um, those of us who have been involved in this Cohen Resnick event every year, I'm, I'm proud to host the event, not just to play in it, but host it. And uh, a large amount of money is raised uh, through the efforts of uh, Cohen Resnick. But I've got to tell you, for, for me and for a lot of the folks here, one of the most powerful things is hearing from the students, the surviving children of these very, very brave men and women uh, who've been lost. For you, Admiral, what is it like to get to know these, how many again, students are we talking about? Well, we've got 135 children in college today and over 700 uh, to send. And since we started in uh, 1980, there have been uh, 1,067 children in the foundation's care. What is it like for you to hear these young people, but to more importantly know what it is that they have sacrificed and their families have sacrificed for this country? Well, Steve, it's very personal for me. I spent 36 years in uniform and 34 years as a SEAL. And uh, many of these children were my men's children. And um, uh, I You called them your men? Oh, yes. They were my men. <laughs> they were my brothers. As a family? Oh, absolutely. You know, you spent 36 years in uniform. You leave your family. Uh, behind and then those who serve with actually become your family so although I've got five brothers and sisters um, um, my son's got godparents or um, uh, one's a naval officer and uh, the wife of a, of, a, of a naval officer because we're so close but um, you know just take Operation Red Wings which uh, was 10 years ago this month when we lost 19 special operators uh, in the Hindu Kush Marcus Luttrell wrote a book called Lone Survivor and a movie was made for that and we lost 11 SEALs that day and nine, uh, uh, eight soldiers. Uh, we have 11 children from the 11 SEALs and eight children from the eight soldiers that this foundation is in the care. And uh, I buried every one of those men and I gave the flag uh, to their widows uh, or their mothers. So when I write these checks, uh, sometimes I can write a check very quickly and sometimes it, it takes me a while because I reminisce about the father, who he was, how he lived, not necessarily how he died, and, um, and how much the young woman has grown from when uh, she was sitting in Arlington National Cemetery next to her mother, and now she'd be uh, uh, a sophomore or junior in college, and in some cases has gone on and graduated from college. So uh, these people are, you know, I consider them to be family members every bit as much as, as my own children, and it's just an honor and a privilege uh, to be able to do this for the foundation and, and for the special operations community. Admiral, what is it that you feel the rest of us Oh those who have given their lives to, um, I mean, I'm going to say to our country, but it's more than our country. What do we owe, not just those men who have mm -hmm. given their lives, but their families, those children? Well, Steve, I, I think that the American people are very appreciative of, um, of people in uniform and veterans right now. I mean, all the time that I was in uniform, people didn't stop and say, thank you for your service. This is only something that has recently come about. And I think it's because we have less than 1% of the American people carrying the load for the war for the last 14 years. But, you know, Americans stop people in uniform and say, thank you very much for your service. When I go through TSA and I show my identification card, the TSA agent always says, thank you for your service, Admiral. We give standing ovations at ballparks. Uh, we allow active duty uh, military to board the aircraft first. But if we really want to be thankful for their service, if we really want to be able to do something, then we need to put a little bit of skin in the game. And when a special operator or any service member loses their life in the service of their country, I think all of us should remember that no child in this great nation should be financially disadvantaged because his or her mother died in the line of duty in the service of the country. So with this college foundation, it's a way for all of us to chip in and send them to college. I'd like to make something perfectly clear. The foundation supports college scholarships. We support tutoring. We give immediate financial assistance to the wounded. We, do the, we provide the counseling. But we would not be able to do any of that without the generosity of American citizens. Although I write the check, it is the donors, the people here today at Cohen Resnick and Cohen Resnick Foundation, they're the ones who make the scholarships possible, and they're the ones who provide immediate financial assistance to the wounded, not me. One more question. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you a question about leadership. Uh, an issue we ask uh, very special leaders about. Um, what would you say the most significant leadership lesson you have learned in your many years in the Navy and, and the very, I was, I was, I was going to say difficult, but extraordinarily hard to imagine situations you have faced as a SEAL. 
Number one leadership lesson you've learned is? Listen, listen. Not all got a good ideas come from the top. And uh, as far as being in special operations and being a SEAL, you know, everybody who goes out on the mission gets a say. And everybody on the mission could win the Medal of Honor, and everybody on the mission could die. So I always used to say, as far as the SEAL team was concerned, it was an employee-owned company. Everybody has a stake in this. So when the stakes are high, you know, the, the senior man actually has to make the decision. But it really is prudent and smart to listen to absolutely everybody, even those folks who don't have that much expertise, because a lot of times people come and they bring no prejudice to it. And you've been doing things for years one way, and somebody may just come in and ask why, and sometimes that why is a very good question that may, ask, uh, may make you just uh, think about what you're doing and why and improve uh, your processes. Admiral, I want to uh, thank you not only for this interview, but more importantly for the, all the years of service uh, to our country. Um, thank you very much. Steve, thank you very much. It was an honor and a pleasure to serve with those folks and serve the American people. Thank you. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by PNC Bank, Bergen Community College, United Water, Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, and by Choose New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. In medical school, doctors hope that someday they won't just practice medicine, they'll pioneer it. At Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, someday isn't just a dream. As one of the nation's leading academic medical centers, we provide advanced medicine and minimally invasive technology to save lives. Someday this expertise will be available everywhere. But for those who can't wait for someday, there's RWJ and Robert Wood Johnson Medical School today. The heart of academic medicine.